Hi, everybody. I'm Phil Town. And I'm Danielle Town. And we're here to talk about mindful money, conscious investing. Rule one investing. Figuring it all out. That's so right. you, you don't have to worry about what's going to happen down the road financially. And whether that's possible or not. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it sounds very difficult. <laughs> and we, and we, we come at it from the point of view of where we think the best investors in the world are. And that would be guys like Charlie Munger, Warren Buffett, uh, Manesh Prabhai, David Einhorn, guys we call rule one investors. So we're going to kind of dive into that, you know, because Warren Buffett said there's two rules of investing and only two rules. And rule number one is don't lose money. And rule number two is don't forget rule number one. Yeah. So all these guys come from this place of don't lose money. Well, how do you do that? So here's Charlie telling the BBC. Well, and so we, um, we spent the last two podcasts talking about the first one. The first point out of this Charlie Munger interview, which we played last time as well. Right. Which and so is, we just want to play it again so we remember, you know, where we are and um, and which point we're on, which will so be number two. When, out exactly. Of four. Two out of out of four. And Charlie's first one, in case she goes by you quickly, yeah. is that you can't do two, three, four in those order, in the order of things you have to do. You can't do that without getting through number one. Number one is the most important screen. Which is... Which is being capable of understanding the business. Keyword. Capable. Capable. So here we go. Charlie Munger, 2012 to the BBC. What they have to do to win. We have to deal in things that we're capable of understanding. And then once we're over that filter, we have to have a business with some intrinsic characteristics that give it a durable competitive advantage. And then, of course, we would vastly prefer a management in place with a lot of integrity and talent. And finally, no matter how wonderful it is, it's not worth an infinite price. So we have to have a price that makes sense and gives a margin of safety considering the natural vicissitudes of life. That's a very simple set of ideas. And the reason that our ideas have not spread faster, is they're too simple. The professional classes can't justify their existence if that's all they have to say. I mean, it's also obvious and so simple. What would they have to do with the rest of the semester? I love how joyful he is about that. <laughs> <laughs> he just has this sense of like, oh, oh, oh. Those people. I mean, you, you know, they, there's a reason why Charlie is a little bit gloaty here. Because, you know, for 40 or 50 years, the academic establishment has insisted that he and Warren are really sort of like monkey slipping coins and they've just gotten lucky in a random game. And more and more, it's becoming clear that the game is not random, that the stock market is not efficiently priced, that there's a lot of emotion around managing money and that that emotion can create prices that are not connected to values. And mm. that's where these guys live and breathe. So it's, you know, he's watched it in his lifetime come full circle now where at top level academics are now proving that Charlie and Warren have been right all along. So, so yeah. they're making plays based on other people's emotions. Absolutely. I mean, I've, I've listened to Charlie a lot in my life and, his strong point, he says, is that they're not only rational investors, they're very rational investors, but they also really know where their boundaries are, where the limits are of their ability, their capability of understanding. That's what he was talking about there. What are the limits of that? And he said, we, Warren and I stay well away from that edge. And that's huge. Like, what are you capable of understanding? Like, we think of it as like digging a canyon, you know, it's sort of like you're digging. You, we, we want to be an inch wide and a mile deep in whatever it is we're getting into here. The, wait, what is the canyon? The canyon is your area of expertise. Yeah, your area of expertise. You know, you're, 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 you don't even have to say expertise. It's kind of where you're competent, hmm. you know. I mean, you could be running a McDonald's franchise and you don't have to be the world's most expert restaurateur, right? I mean, it's just all you have to do is be competent at doing this. And you can do very well running a reasonably, you know, easy to understand business. So you don't have to be a rocket scientist here. 
You just got to stay with the stuff you do understand. So why is it a canyon? I just think of it as that in my own way of thinking about investing is like, I want to get, I want to think of, I've got walls here. Deep instead of wide. Is that Deep what, is instead that what of mean? wide. And I, and I want, in my mind, the image is walls. Don't touch the walls. Oh. Right? Don't touch the walls because now you're no longer on solid ground. Now you're at the edge of what you understand. And that's where the danger is. That's also where the opportunity is. And so over, because that's where you widen your, your knowledge. And over a 30, 40 year investing lifetime, you can become a pretty wide canyon. You know, you don't have to stay stuck in where you start. You, you find things that are sort of on the edge. So let's say you're a teacher and you really get education. That's your whole thing. You love it. You're passionate about it. You do it. You make money in it. And so you start investigating companies that are in education. You're looking at public companies like ITT Educational that does vocational schools, University of Phoenix Online, which is yeah. Apollo. Well, you mentioned that example last time. And, you know, my question was, how on earth could a teacher really know anything about those companies when running an educational company is completely different than teaching a classroom full of children? But I... I I can see that maybe that's at least an area that I, as somebody who's a teacher, certainly knows more about than I do, you well, know, not being a teacher. It's not so much knowing about it. It's about kind of grokking it. You grokking know? it? Yeah. What is that? Oh, my gosh. That's a 1960s term, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Oh, my gosh. That comes from, I think, Ice Nine. Um, what is Ice Nine? Who are you? What is happening? <laughs> There's a guy named Kurt Vonnegut oh. <laughs> who wrote all these great books with a really, you know, cynical view of the world. And um, and he uses this term grok. He just came up with it, G-R-O-K, which means I get it on some deep fundamental level. I, I have never heard You've that never as heard a Vonnegut term. No. Oh, yeah, grok. Grok rocks, man. Grok, grok is a 60s, 70s term. <laughs> yeah, it's like I totally get you, man. I dig you. I understand. I get it on a deep level. I might not be able to explain it like I'm a teacher and I can't explain why ITT Educational might be a better company than K-12 because I've got to learn that yet. But I get the educational world because I'm in it. I'm playing in it. That's the ocean I swim in. You know those people. You know what they're about. Yeah. At least you, you hope you do. You, or at least you. it's just that you feel comfortable there. You're, yeah, that's my world. I, I have to feel comfortable around this because these guys are teachers and all that. So what I need to learn is about the business. But I'm already swimming in that water, right? We've kind of talked about that yeah, before. Yeah, yeah, that's what we talked about the last two times, really, is how to graduate from the field of your current understanding based on your job or your people that you know into this sort of what I think of as like another world of big business that's traded on the stock market. Yeah, and which can feel intimidating, but when you break it down, you know, it's like trying to climb a mountain, you know, if you try to think about being at the top, it's a huge task. But if you think about just taking one step in front of the other, you can break that down into manageable chunks. And that's what we want to do when we're, in my words, building, you know, digging this yeah. canyon. Well, I didn't know that you weren't supposed to touch the walls of the canyon. <laughs> I just thought of it as a canyon and maybe the walls were actually helpful to you. But they're not. Stay so it's away from the like, walls of the canyon. So like you're standing on a very tall, narrow cliff and you're not supposed to fall off the cliff. You've just completely inverted my I, metaphor. I apologize. It's completely upside. It's completely You've filled in now. the canyon and taken away <laughs> the <did>. walls. <laughs> but I get it. You're, that'll work. Okay. Just don't get too near the edge. I actually like, like yours better. Well, I, I, get, I like the canyon thing because it, to me, implies depth of knowledge. Because it's hard to dig a plateau. <laughs> <laughs> you tend to just come upon those you, you come upon plateaus <laughs> you can narrow them but it's very hard to widen them so that's why the canyon but your metaphor is actually better for that moment of getting near the edge where you don't want to be near the edge of this thing so um the, the key is knowing where the edge is so we really start with small steps just baby steps and just realize that this process it's going to be fun, and it's going to be a lifetime. It never ends. Those two things are so interesting that you say that, because it does not feel fun to me or to most people. 
and it feels like something that you have to do very quickly or else you're going to run out of money that's, in retirement. That's why it doesn't feel like fun is because you feel like you have to do it really quickly. Yeah, and there's a lot of pressure. a huge, enormous thing to climb this mountain. You have to do it quickly. That's right. right? Quickly and perfectly. Yeah. Because you can't lose money, rule number one. Right. But what if it was like, okay, you really got lots of time that – Really, climbing this mountain is is not about – well, there's going to be some of you that have a time issue, right? Because you didn't get started on this early enough. And we'll talk about that as we go. That can be a subject uh, – really good subject for some future podcasts. But for right now, let's just make the basic assumption that we do have time. If you've got 15 years, 20 years, you've got time. You can do nothing for the next two or three years at all and still compound money in the 20 30% range. If you follow along what these guys are teaching us here. So it's the critical thing is you've got this huge filter, this huge screen that you have to go through. And it is, are you capable of understanding yeah. this industry yeah. right here? Yeah. And so the second one that Charlie said is, is it a business with some intrinsic characteristics that give it a durable competitive advantage? Yes. That's so vague. It's beautiful. Some intrinsic <laughs> characteristics. I'm not going to tell you what they are, but they better be there. <laughs> and it has to have a competitive advantage. So it's maybe terrible. maybe the professor should get onto this because that might take a couple of classes to work through. <laughs> what exactly is an intrinsic characteristic of a business? What does that mean? Like sometimes you hear Charlie talk about it in terms of a franchise. You know, it's got to, but I don't know that that explains it any further either. So let's, shall we chew on this one a little bit? Please. Okay. I hope that you know what the intrinsic characteristics are. Well, I'm, I'm going to walk into it a little bit backwards. So okay. I want to start with this idea of a durable competitive advantage. Durable, obviously, is something that's going to last for a long time. And a competitive advantage means that you have an edge in the marketplace. So if you think about starting a little business up, most people, when they're thinking about it clearly, want to have what we'd call a niche business. You want to be the only person in it, right? You just you don't want somebody else already in there because then you have to take some of their customers or you're up against their advertising or whatever. So the idea of starting small businesses is you want to get a niche, some kind of a little niche business. You Maybe you're the only Mexican restaurant in a pile of restaurants in a corner. Or maybe your home cleaning business um, is, um, is just for high-end homes and you've got this great staff that wears uniforms. You know, something that gives you an edge. Something that makes you different from yeah. the other companies yeah. around you. And that something is you want it to be a, an intrinsic characteristic of the business. You want it to be the way the business functions is that thing. Like you don't have to tack it on and try to make it work. It's because that's what your business is. Your business is doing home cleaning for high-end homes and you have a staff of, you know, really smart people who get along with wealthy people really well and you build this really durable competitive advantage. And that one that I'm describing right now would be called a brand. If you remove that intrinsic characteristic or characteristics, does the business die? Let's talk about it in terms of the brand characteristic. Okay, so when you build a brand, you're basically saying that what you got last time is what you're going to get this time. And what you got last time is so good and so wonderful that you're not thinking of uh, my business as a generic thing, you're thinking of it as a specific. So, for example, Coca-Cola is the classic brand, right? Because we don't think about going and getting a cola. <laughs> <laughs> Coke has our brain cooked to where we think of getting a Coke. Or In the South, people say, I'm going to go get a Coke when they mean any kind of soda. That's a brand. <laughs> exactly right. And in the South, you don't even think about going to get a Pepsi. Especially in Atlanta. Oh, sure. Right? So these guys get mind share. And, and this is it becomes an intrinsic character of the business. It's something that's fundamental to the whole business. And they protect it life and death, right? So when New Coke came out, 
back in the 90s, it was a comic tragedy. I mean, they didn't have to do it. They just had some guy running the company that thought, wow, what a great idea. We've tested this and people want new Coke. And it turned out that they were just blowing holes in their own 100-year-old brand, which is a bad idea. So an intrinsic characteristic, we, we think that there's actually just five of them. You want to get into them? Yeah. A little bit? Sure. Yeah, because we'll, we'll, we'll narrow it down a lot if we can really package the world up mostly. You know, so, by the way, this will follow the 80-20 rule. 80% of the companies that we're talking about will have one of these five characteristics. There's always the 20% that's a little bit different, but those are harder, and we don't do harder. Do you so, have a list of characteristics? I do. That sounds really helpful. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> From my, Dude. I have no idea what he's talking about. And not surprisingly, I didn't make these up. These are pretty much from Ward and Charlie. When you dig in deep enough, this is what you'll find that okay. they're looking for. All right. So the five intrins uh, classically intrinsic characteristics. Yes. Brand, secrets, switching, toll bridge, and price. Oh, these sound like competitive advantages, rather than intrinsic characteristics. Oh, these are intrinsic characteristics. So they're Think, both. They're both. Yeah. Well, the intrinsic characteristic creates the durable competitive advantage. Got it, got it. Got That's it. the whole point. So brand is the toughest one to build. This takes a long time. Okay. So, but you can see it the easiest. So Harley Davidson has a brand, Ford has a brand, and so on. And these brands are defended with advertising and a ton of money. And what you really do with Coca-Cola is you build this huge brand and what it gets you is shelf space in a grocery store. And your distributors hold on to that shelf space like it's life or death battle against Pepsi and against anybody else that's trying to sneak in there, right? So that's the war that goes on out there um, in brand management. And those are tough. The, I mean, when you, you know you've got one because you, you just name the thing and people think of it as that thing rather than the industry generic, you know? So let's go on to a couple of the others and you'll start to see this unfold a little bit, I think. Secrets are classic protection. A secret is something that Pfizer or Merck um, would get when they develop a drug and they get a patent on it. So patents defend secret uh, and it becomes an intrinsic characteristic of the business. How do you protect yourself? Oh, we're a company that goes out and gets patents. That's our, what Buffett would call our moat. So this whole idea comes down to understanding this metaphor of water around the castle that protects it from being attacked. Like, yeah. just get, get this in your picture, your picture in your head. In Japan, there are castles which have never been attacked because they built these giant moats around them and it's simply impossible. The only way that castle falls is from internal strife or, you know, somebody gets in there. They can, You can't take a, an army across the moat. So what this moat thing means in terms of business is that you really can't, don't bother to attack me because I'll simply destroy your army. The, the cost of even trying to cross the moat is so stupidly high that you'll never get there. And one of the things these guys say is, imagine you had the entire market cap of the company, like what it's worth in the market today. Could you take that amount of money and successfully compete? And think about a company like Coca-Cola. And the answer would be good luck because Pepsi has that amount of money. And it's You're saying trouble. could you take that amount of money, start a new company, a new company and, compete and compete with that with other them. company? Yeah. And you'll look at what Buffett buys. He buys these big moat companies that have this intrinsic characteristic. So here's a classic one is Burlington Northern Santa Fe, which is a railroad that runs from Wyoming to Atlanta and from Long Beach, California to Chicago. They only compete against one or two other railroads in both of those markets. And if you wanted to get coal out of Wyoming and get it to Atlanta, they'll ship it for you for 40 bucks a ton. I mean, I can't get a safe from Dick's Sporting Goods to my house four miles away <laughs> for $40, okay? <laughs> that sounds like it's not a secret moat. No, Sorry, that's not a secret, secret moat. We're talking about these as moats. That's true. So this is just in general a kind of a moat that, that, that this company has. So you're using moat as another word for competitive advantage. Yes. Right? Yes, yes, yes. You know, castle, and, moat, And there are these intrinsic characteristics, five of them which provide you with this durability. 
if you've got it. So Burlington North is a classic example of a toll bridge mode, which we'll come back to. But think about it just for a second. How would you compete? If you had all of the money that it would cost to buy Burlington Northern right now, how would you compete with them? Because you can't get a right of way to put in a railroad. You could have all the money on the moon and it would it, it, that there is, and you probably couldn't get the right of ways to put in this railroad. The regulatory authorities aren't going to give them to you. And so that's a giant, giant, durable competitive advantage that comes from the intrinsic characteristic of that business. You got to build a railroad and you can't. Okay. Yeah. That's a, that's a, that's what an intrinsic characteristic looks like. Okay. So some of them are a little easier to see than others. Secret so moats. So we've got brand. Mm -hmm. sec oh, secret. Go ahead. Secret moats. This is very much like a kind of a 3M. We figured out how to make sticky stuff that doesn't stick too hard. And you can now put it on post-it notes. You can do vet wrap. You know, it's just all these cool things that come out of that. And they may not even patent it because they don't want you to know how they happened on that exact formula. It's true. It's a constant question with new companies, especially now in the software field. Is it worthwhile to patent something? And do you want to because it might be easier to keep it as a trade secret and protect it that way? Nobody else has to know about it. Well, what do, you, what do you recommend when guys are coming in uh, the it door? It completely depends on the company. So it's all over the place. Yeah. But yeah. what you're trying to do is build a more durable business. Absolutely. So you're putting up legal walls. Sometimes. Yeah, which can be about a secrets mode. It can be about a switching mode. It can be about a toll bridge. So and Legal walls are very important. I mean, um, the U.S. has a good amount of legal history of protecting businesses, protecting trade secrets. You look at companies in a place like China where intellectual property is not particularly protected by their legal system. And um, you know, a lot of companies won't even do business with Chinese companies because they're worried about their trade secrets or their copyrights or their trademarks being misused. Well, can we put that on our list of things to talk about? I'm writing this down right now. Chinese companies. Yeah. Because there is a whole thing about investing in Chinese companies. And I'm you're, sure there you're, is. You're right on top of a big part of that issue is the rule of law. But in the U.S., my gosh, I mean, lawyers like you who do emerging corporations are so critical. I mean, if we wanted to put money into a company, we have to make sure that the legal walls are up to protect this switching moat or this brand that they've got or this toll bridge moat that they've got. We want to protect it. I mean, if, we're, if we own the railroad, we want our lawyers down there making sure the regulators don't change their mind about sticking in another railroad. Sure. And I think that that brings us back to our values discussion of last time, because with, again, this is, I know nothing about the railroad situation. Maybe there's some public policy reason that we would want to have railroads be more open to new companies. And they're not right now, from what you're saying. No, very so difficult. You would want to either invest in a company that either supports or does not support that kind of expansion to, based on your values, right? Right. Which, by the way, takes us also back to the idea of being an inch wide and a mile deep. Because you want to kind of know if there's going to be a regulatory change that would affect your moat. Mm -hmm. It'd be pretty dramatic. To, Absolutely. And you can see well, these okay, things. It sounds like it can remove it entirely if you have that kind of moat. It could remove it entirely. And, and so the good news about this is this sort of moat destruction through regulatory changes is like watching an, a, a slow moving iceberg. I mean, it takes years. You would have to literally have gone to some island somewhere for four or five years and not even paid attention to anything you own, not to see that this was coming at you in time to get out of this business and move on to some other business. So there is some maintenance to do, which can we put that on our list? Maintenance. Maintenance. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the more we discuss this, the longer our list gets. And I'm keeping thinking. Well, that that's a good thing. I mean, there's a lot to say about this. Which means I think Charlie's gloating about how you could <laughs> rip this out in one minute of your first class of your first semester might be a little bit of it's hyperbole. It's just too simple for everybody. <laughs> it's just entirely simple. Yeah, simple is. But um, let's come back to uh, to these five. Yeah, okay. So we've done brand and secret. Yep. What's number three? Switching, incredibly powerful mode. Switching. So right, that's me... a, we kind of just talked about that with the railroad. No, railroads are not so much switching. 
Railroads are more like a toll bridge. We'll come to that too. But switching is more about, let's see, you've got a dentist and they have x-rayed you and they know everything going on in there and they're competent dentists and certainly there's better dentists out there maybe. Uh, okay, so I was thinking it's difficult to switch from one railroad to another, but you're saying there's actually more to it. And really the switching one is just... Pain, it's kind of a pain. Pain. It's possible. Sure. But it's kind of a pain. Kind of a pain. And the, the, the moat size, the, the body of water that you got across, is about how much pain the switch would take. Okay, so here's some classic companies that have recognized that the amount of pain it would take to get them out of your company and put in somebody else in their place is far too much to even consider. IBM is one of those. Microsoft is one of those. Oracle is one of those. How are they a pain to switch from? Oh my gosh, these are you guys. Are talking about business to business kind of? Yeah, because okay. they're in your back room and they have built all this stuff that's very specific. This is especially true before, um, before the cloud came along. They've got all this hardware in there that's running all of this very specific software that was written very specifically for your business. And if it was, so, it was so bad. Once I gave a speech, I was working with Steve Jobs' company, Next, um, as a, I was funding a vendor, or rather a, a third-party software company. And uh, Steve's company asked me to go out to New York to the World Trade Center and give a speech about the new server uh, kind of structure that, that IT was going to be using, using these Next computers. And I had 150 guys in the audience who were, all the IT people from American Express companies. And they were locked into IBM mainframes and they couldn't even think about it. They couldn't think about moving to a much more dynamic, much less expensive, much more powerful client server model because they were locked into mainframe model. Yeah, that next computer was so interesting because from everything I've read about it, it was a much better system. And much. they just couldn't get the market share. They the, couldn't get people to adopt it. Right. Because Microsoft yeah. came in while Steve Jobs was making this beautiful square box and having everybody remake all of the boards and everything had to fit into the square box just because he wanted a square box. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, Bill Gates went up there and went, hey, hurry up and get any old piece of thing out of there. And let's get Windows NT into everybody's client server model, right? And Sun was out there cranking away and they were getting the client server model and they ran right by Steve. He was cutting edge and it was too slow to the market. Oh, well, then everything I just said is wrong because they would switch if they switched to Microsoft and Sun. Eventually they did. So first off, you've got the, the smaller, quicker competitors who start to make the switch or they're brand new and they're starting up an office and they get the newest, coolest stuff. And gradually, they forced IBM to come around. And that's actually what's happening right now in the cloud. IBM is being forced to turn this big aircraft carrier off of you know, a client server model, which they've now just sold to Lenovo over in China. They say, here, take it. We're moving to a different model entirely. So Jenny Rometty at IBM is trying to make that turn. And you know, they're going to make it. It's going to be awesome. But they were last. <laughs> you know, they were forced to do it by Oracle, Sun, Sun Oracle, which Oracle owns now, by Amazon putting out this monster, you know, just, you know cloud system that is very inexpensive to use. And um, uh, guys like- uh, Google Drive. Oh my God, Google, Google Drive, Salesforce.com comes in with, you know, software as a service. And this whole model has changed now. So if you're, let's say, investing in a company that has this huge switching mode like IBM, you're protected even though they're so slow to turn this ship that it's like you got everybody saying, they'll never make it, it's not going to happen. But IBM's been through that about four or five times in its history, and it always makes the turn because it's got such a huge switching moat. Giant, giant protection. you got a puzzled look on your face. I don't see the switching moat. Ah, I've got IBM, nine out of the world's ten biggest banks, international banks, have IBM gear in there. And while they may want to go to Amazon, they may 
you know, their IT department is dying to so go to. So it's literally the physical servers. The physical stuff. They lease them. It's, and their software is written a certain way, yeah. and they have this fear of losing control of their data because that's all. Look at what happened to Target, and IBM Absolutely. is like, IBM is like, it won't happen with us because we control your hardware, and we've got a control of the bottleneck. So IBM's out there pitching their security. Stay with us. We're the guys that really know. We've got the big blue yeah. brand and switching mode. Yeah, so, and yeah. the cloud is so fascinating because it's such the it's the wild west of the cloud right now. Oh yeah, and that's what large companies are worried about is the privacy and security of their data going to these startup companies, which are doing everything they can to protect it. Um, but I can see if you have to explain your board of directors what you're doing with your enormous company's data, which is the lifeblood of that company, you um, have an easier time of it if you refer to using IBM or another large well-established company. There you go. So really, if you think about IBM, they have a brand moat because you think of them as an enterprise model with security, and they have a switching moat because once you take them in there, good luck ever getting them out, right? Because now they've trained your engineers. They have all that support back there. You just It's just a nightmare to get them out of there. You'd have to have such compelling reasons. And since security is so important, Jenny Remote is very smart. She's going to the market and saying, hey, you want security, you want a hybrid, you want a cloud, you got to be with IBM. We're the only ones in the world that can provide that. So, yeah, there goes there goes somebody having not as good a day as we are. <laughs> oh my gosh, I hope they're all right. Aww. All right, shall we go on? Yeah, number right. four. Number four is toll bridge mode. Okay, a toll bridge. Okay, you hear those sirens going by. Those guys have a toll bridge moat. That's the fire department, and they are a government monopoly. So there, no reason there couldn't be private fire departments all over the place, right? And they charge you for coming to your fire and all that. Well, <laughs> well, Teton County has a volunteer fire department. There you go. Yeah. But these guys have been appointed by the, the, the county government to be the fire department. And so they have monopoly. And that is a toll bridge. In other words, yes, you can put out your fire other ways. You can get a garden hose. You could call in some guy to bomb it with water. I imagine you could find five or six different ways to put out the fire in your house. But the cost of doing it that way is so extremely more than just calling the fire department that you would never consider doing it any other way. So think of it. The reason we call it a toll bridge mode is because like, if you want to cross a river, and there's a bridge, like going from Marin County to, into San Francisco, there's the Golden Gate Bridge. And you have to pay $5 to go through the bridge. You don't have to pay $5. Well, you can you, drive you, around the Richmond Bay Bridge. You've just listed two government agencies yes. that we pay for through our taxes, not directly, and which would actually probably prefer for us to use them less. <laughs> Good point, except... There are some out there I'm going to tell you about that are toll bridge modes that are government agencies and they're public companies, both, which are really interesting investments. So the first idea is to get the concept, right? You've got this bridge and it's a lot shorter to come from Marin County, pay the $5 and go into San Francisco than to drive the Richmond Bay Bridge down Highway 80 across the Oakland Bay Bridge into San Francisco. Because the Oakland Bay Bridge is free. And the Richmond Bridge is free. Okay. It's just going to cost you $5 of gas and another hour. So no one would do it. No one does it. Well, and that's why they, they didn't used to charge for the Golden Gate Bridge. They started charging to reduce traffic. <laughs> and what happened? <laughs> they could raise that toll. And I imagine they probably have, you know, sat in the little room and said, we could put this at $20 and these people would still have to pay. I mean, a lot of people would. would of course well. they would. Yeah. Of course they would. Because why? Because... It's a moat, a giant moat that protects that franchise. All right, so Burlington Northern, we mentioned before, is a railroad that has a kind of toll bridge moat. Now, they're a duopoly. Union Pacific also runs out of Wyoming. But that's it. Those are your two choices. So do you think those guys kind of look at what each other's charging and kind of not, you know, not be too competitive? Yeah. I mean, you've got a locked-in margins because there's nobody else that can put in track. All right, so there's an example of a toll bridge. Now, another one is... In Georgia, if you want power, you go to Southern. Southern Companies provides the power in Georgia. I can do it other ways. I can put in solar panels. I can put in wind machines. 
but that's those are more sort of environmental statements. They're not cheap. Yeah, and a lot of people don't realistically have that option. Yeah, exactly. So that's a toll bridge. If I want power, the cheapest way to get, I mean, I can always drive around and 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 cross with the ferry or get on the river where there's, or doesn't, I don't have any river to cross, but it's just so much cheaper to just do it this way. So those are really, really good moats. If you can find a company that's got one, those are awesome. Are there any purely private companies that have a toll bridge moat? Well, Burlington Northern is purely private. Yeah. I mean, Warren Buffett bought the whole thing because it's essentially a utility, mm-hmm. you know? Um and then there are companies like Southern, PG&E in California, um, Laclede, which owns gas, natural gas companies in Kansas City and, uh, and St. Louis and Burlington. Um, I mean, Birmingham, Alabama. And so these companies are private, but they have a kind of government grant to perform as a monopoly. It's, they're great investments if you can get them cheaply. Obviously, mostly you can't. You know, they're, they're usually bid up pretty good. <clears throat> so those are toll bridge moats. And when you can get one of those, you buy them because they're awesome. Hmm. Um, and then the last one is the price moat. A price moat is different than what it sounds like. You think of like the low price guy. That's the guy with the moat. But that's not true. We can Any company can price their products really low, right? So we can get into a price war. And what happens is you end up losing all of your profit margin and now you're building product and selling it cheaper than it costs you to do it which is a recipe for disaster that's what amazon did with the uh uh the kindle right exactly they acknowledged they're losing money on it yep and they tried to punch through you know now here's the thing if you've got a company that has not the lowest price but the lowest cost of whatever it is they're doing, then they can have the lowest price. And the other guys all have to go out of business and they're still making money. So a really good example of that is a company called CF Industries that has most of the nitrogen fertilizer business in the U.S. They've acquired all the little guys and they've built this really, really great company that has almost a monopoly. I mean, they're not a toll bridge because you can get it from other people, but they're close And the reason that they got it was because they have the lowest cost of production in the whole country. They can provide a farmer nitrogen fertilizer at a lower cost and still make money than anybody in the world. So when prices start coming down for farming fertilizer, it gets better for them in a weird kind of way, right? They're going to have a couple bumpy years of not quite so much profit. But meanwhile, their competitors are going to go out of business or be bought by CF. And that's what's happened over the last years. You're so, looking for a company that has some sort of supply line difference from its competitors. Sure. So, Like Walmart, for example, has created this amazing machine that keeps driving prices lower and lower and squeezing price like crazy. And that's the only reason they exist is to squeeze price so that you can't compete with them out there anywhere in terms of just pure price, right? So what do they do? They squeeze their employees. They squeeze the healthcare system. They squeeze their producers. They make Smithfield Foods put hogs into containers the size of a coach seat and keep them there their whole life, jack them full of antibiotics so they can meet Walmart's demand for cheap pork. I mean, you can create this nightmare of being the low-cost guys, which I think Walmart has managed to do. They've arrived at that, oh, we are now being evil. And still incredibly successful. And more and more and people invest in them. So now Walmart's going to try to go be evil in China. You know? <laughs> <laughs> My biases are rolling out here. Yeah. You know, if you don't feel like Walmart's evil, then great. They're going to be fine into your value set. And which takes us back to values. You've got to have your values yeah. connected to your money. Don't forget that. And it'll be more fun to invest that way. So that's a price moat. Um, you know, that's what Costco goes for. Um uh, Walmart, you know, companies that are really low cost producers and able to get cheap stuff, cheap supply line. So those five will cover the vast majority of companies out there that we would be able to successfully invest in. Um, and those are the intrinsic characteristics that Charlie's talking about. They're built, the company's built that way from square one. Is it really true that they're built that way from square one or do they pivot at some point? A lot of companies make a pivot. 
A lot of companies change over time. Look at IBM. You just were talking about them changing from the giant mainframe systems and the business um, networked systems into the cloud now. Right. But that pivot isn't a change of their moat. They're, they're very consciously aware that if they can get into your company deeply, all they, then they can make the next change 20, 30 years from now when it's no longer mainframes, it's client server. Oh, it's no longer client server. It's distributed software as a service, platform as a service. They can make that change. Those changes don't come along every day. What, so they know as long as they have a switching mode and a brand mode that they've got the time to fully assess whether this is the next big thing. Let me, let me give you an example from IBM's history. Tom Watson Sr. built that company as a punch card company, right? It was tabulated with punch cards. And uh, the Univac computer came out after World War II. And um, it was offered to Tom Watson to buy the company because they were running out of money. And Watson was like, oh, heck no. That's a piece of crap. <laughs> Who needs that? Right? But his son recognized that this was going in a new direction that, that Tom Sr. couldn't even begin to think about properly. IBM had to, Tom Watson Jr. built an entire new R&D group because the old R&D group could not make the paradigm shift. So think about how big the moat was that IBM had in the early 1950s is they had years to make that shift even while their competition was cranking away and had made the shift earlier. I mean, GE was in that business and, and uh, uh, Rand was, uh, was in it and just big companies that were in that had already made the shift literally years before IBM. And it was going the same thing that was going on today is IBM's over, they're toast, they're way behind the times. But they had such a strong switching mode and such a, such a strong brand that they had time to evaluate it and change which is what's going on now. So these moats, see the key thing that Charlie's saying is these intrinsic characteristics that, okay, we know that we're gonna protect ourselves by being deep into that customer, massively, okay? And that gives us durability. I, I, I'll tell you another story. You wanna hear another quick story? Sure. We got time? Sure. Okay, your uncle built a company that had an incredible switching moat. What he did was he built a company that was um, all about brokering power as they were deregulating gas and deregulating uh, power off of dams and so on, um, it became necessary to match up buyers and sellers because price now became an issue. It was no longer regulated. And so Steve built this company that, that put buyers and sellers together. And what they did to create a switching moat is that they would take, the, I mean, the limited number of buyers and limited number of sellers, right? I mean, you're selling to big electric utilities and places like that. So his guys would take the buyers out to the World Series, the football games. They would go out to all kinds of places. And anything these 28 to 35-year-old buyers wanted to do, that's what these guys took them to do and paid for it and created relationships that allowed them to get an open phone line in to that guy's office that stayed open all day. All they had to do is say, beep, hey, John, this is Bob over at Amrex. I uh, want to talk to you about, I've got a price here on gas, blah, blah, blah. And they could do deals that nobody else could do. They created a switching mode. It was awesome. They, they, these guys would have to rip their phones out to compete with them. It was very cool. The story of these companies is very interesting. And it's different from how I think of investing normally, which is all balance sheets, financial statements, and whatever the current price is in the stock market. This... You, is, is much more interesting to me than that stuff, you know? Like, I love talking to people about their current companies, and hearing the history of a company is equally interesting. That is awesome, because we, <laughs> we are digging the canyon right now. This is what the canyon is. So yeah. we're, we're, we're getting our inch wide, mile deep, and we're doing it because it's something we really are kind of into, like we're sort of into education or whatever else. We're into railroad trains, I don't know. And so you, you start going in like this, and pretty soon you're going to have some questions about how do I know for sure that this has these intrinsic characteristics? Absolutely. What we should talk about next time are some of the numbers that you look at in those accounting statements, which have a bazillion numbers and make everybody want to gag. There's only like six or seven numbers that you really kind of need to focus on. What is the third one in our 
in Charlie's four the third one principles. is management. Oh, so we're going to skip over management? And- mm, no. We're going to talk a little bit about some numbers you might have to look at. Do you want to even, or is it going to make you just go gray? We can talk. Face? No, you have to talk numbers at some point. Okay. Then the next time, we're going to pick this up okay. with the numbers that prove that there's a moat. Okay. Cool. All right. All right. Until then, good talking to you. Thanks for listening to Invested, the Rule One podcast. If you like us, please subscribe and leave a review for us on iTunes. You can get our notes and links for this podcast and post comments about this show and get more information about how to invest on your own by going to ruleonepodcast.com. Everything we've discussed in this podcast is either Danielle's opinion or my opinion and is not to be taken as investment advice because... I am not your investment advisor, nor have I considered your personal situation as your fiduciary. This podcast is for your entertainment and education only, and I hope you've enjoyed it. So until next week, it's time to go play. See ya.